Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I am absolutely delighted to have a very special guest with us today, Richard Strozzi Heckler. Richard is a pioneer in bringing somatics and embodiment practices in leadership and team development in a variety of industries, as well as to international peace work and the military. In fact, he was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal for developing the groundbreaking leadership program for the United States Marine Corps. Richard has a PhD in psychology. He is a seventh degree black belt in Shihan in Aikido and has been named one of the top 50 executive coaches in the art and practice of leadership coaching and in profiles in coaching. Richard is the founder of Strozzi Somatics and Somatic Coaching and Two Rock Aikido as well as being a co-founder of the Lomi School and the Tamalpayas Aikido. He has written nine books, including In Search of the Warrior Spirit, The Leadership Dojo, Being Human at Work, and his latest, Embodying the Mystery, which will be coming out this June. On a personal note, I got to attend a 10-week course through the Strozzi Institute called Embodied Leadership Core which is a neuroscience-based training program that integrated many powerful concepts and tools, including mindfulness and martial arts, to help leaders be even more present and effective under pressure. It was an absolutely excellent training, and I'm absolutely delighted to have you here with us, Richard. Thank you. Glad to be here, Ben. Thank you. Welcome. Um, would you be willing to share with us uh, a little bit about how you got into this work? Um, I think that there's a couple of things. Uh, one is that I, on my mother's side, um, my grandmother, my matriarchal grandmother, uh, she was had, was a very had a very spiritual bent to her, and um, I lived with her often with my with my mother. And uh, my father was in the military, so he was out at sea, but she had a very strong effect on me in terms of really holding kind of a uh, uh, holding spirit and spirituality in a prominent place. Um, the other things I'd like to share is that um, in many ways, I come from the tradition of the bodily arts. Like I started martial arts when I was between my 12th and 13th year and went through, started with judo, jujitsu, karate and was ranked in all of those. Um, and I went to university on an athletic scholarship. So there I was um, really steeped in this notion of what is uh, spirit? What is this um, animating principle that moves us? And being in a um, uh, discourse, this athletic discourse where you got better if you practiced, period. And if you had a good mentor or a coach that really knew how to help you practice better, things began to change. So that was a deep dye that went into me in, in that particular way. And, um, you know, I uh, love the, 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 the dojos and the gyms. And basically, I was around men all the time. I love the camaraderie. I love, I love the notion of being pushing myself and you know, trying for excellence. And the conversations we had weren't very interesting to me. I don't want that to sound like pompous, but I could feel that I had a hunger for something else besides we're gonna talk about having beers or fixing our cars or our girlfriends or something, something deeper. So I, um, you know, my undergraduate degree was in literature then uh, compared to philosophy and, and um, uh, you know, clinical psychology where I got my master's degree in philosophy and uh, PhD in psychology. And these were great conversations and deeply, deeply moving to me. Um, but everybody was like back then kind of in a coffee shop and smoking cigarettes and kind of hunched over. And so while I was in this world, beautiful world of ideas, it was like bodies were atrophying. Our bodies had no place at all. So my life really has been a, a commute between the dojos, places of training, where you practice with another a community of practitioners, to the halls of um, uh, philosophy, for example. 
Thank you. It's absolutely fascinating that you got to kind of experience both kinds of worlds. You know, some might look at it as kind of two extremes in a way, right? And uh, and to kind of blend between the two of them and take what what was useful and important to you and meaningful to you, I imagine, from all of those worlds to create something very special for all of us. So what is somatics for people who are not quite familiar with that? Um, somatics comes from a early Greek word of soma, which literally generally translates the living body in its wholeness. And somatics is the art and science of the soma. So when we say the living body in its wholeness, it basically points to this notion that our ancestors, uh, human beings, really pre-industrialized, really had this idea of there wasn't a body, there wasn't a mind, and there wasn't a spirit, but there was this shape. And we call this the shape of our experience. And in this shape or this form, um, there's emotions, there's our language, there's thinking, uh, there's sensing and feeling. Uh, there's wounds, there's the healing of the wounds. So everything happens inside of this soma. So we don't have to look necessarily um, that we're in these um, stacks of mind, body, spirit, but it's what's occurring right here. I think of it, the soma as our livingness. This, this is our livingness. This is the shape of our experience and how we live through that livingness. And why is it important for people listening to uh, really understand that concept and, you know, how to uh, familiarize themselves or refamiliarize themselves with their soma, um, with those aspects of themselves? Why is that relevant? Well, let me say something uh, that I think has relevance for all of us, and that's that I, I would claim that one of the reasons that uh, it's so easy for us to pollute our waters and stain our air and poison our soil is because we're out of touch with our bodies. And what I mean by that is that we're out of touch with a sense of feeling. And I don't mean have a feeling, I mean that, that core animating energy that moves through us. And furthermore, I would say that one of the reasons that um, there's a growing gap between those that have and those that don't have. So I'm very aware that where I'm about an hour from San Francisco, there's one out of six children that won't be, a, that may not have a full meal today. So this widening gap that we have and is because we're out of touch with our bodies, our feeling self. And one of the reasons that conflict now can so easily move towards aggression and then violence is the same thing. Is that we're out of touch with this, this unifying principle that moves through us. And that my experience has shown me that if we start to touch into that, not just the idea of it, but we actually have the felt experience of this life force. Um, you know, we call that energy here. Other, uh, cultures will say ki or chi or uh, uh, ilan vital prana etc is that if we touch into that it can it has a wisdom that's actually three over three billion years old and it can inform us about i think wisdom and compassion and right living skillful action thank you and you know, what I'm kind of hearing here is the importance of being kind of more integrated, if you will, with ourselves, you know, and and when we do that, then we can uh, perceive more unity in the world around us, right? Where I'm not separate from that uh, sweet little child that doesn't get to eat breakfast today, right? It's that when we can kind of heal that divide, if you will, um, then our perceptions will change and we'll be able to have even more compassion for others and more solution. And I think what's really uh, valuable about the work that you bring to our world is that you help us create that integration within ourselves and then extend that out. And so can you tell us a little bit more about what is meant by embodiment or embodied transformation? Yes. 
you know, the, the word embodiment is, is, is um, unique and singular. And at the same time, we can say that somebody may not be embodied, but they're driving their cars at 70 miles an hour safely. And they're tying their shoes. I mean, they can do things. Um, and uh, it's important for us to understand that something around maybe 600 years ago, there was this notion that uh, if we really cultivated our rational thinking and our logical analytic thinking, we would be overcome. We could overcome these superstitions that really were um, uh, tearing the world apart at that time. That became incorporated inside of our um, institutions, our educational institution, where children will sit down and we, we learn things. So I'm not arguing against that. It's given us law, it's given us engineering, it's given us medicine. But what it's done is pruned away this notion of our felt sense, really the sensory part of our nervous system and how we can um, uh, make really deep, authentic, meaningful contact with others in which we can take on their concerns or the world's concerns because we begin to understand that if somebody else isn't free, we're not free. If somebody else is really hungry when I'm eating a lot is that there's not much fulfillment in that. And that intelligence really brings us to the place that you just touched on, which is really the fallacy of a separate self, that really we are deeply, deeply connected. And like I said, what my experience has revealed to me is that if I touch that inside of myself, I'll realize this, this, this fellowship and this community of like-minded souls. So that's really a fundamental reason for embodiment. There's other things for embodiment that, for example, um, a lot of the work we do at Strozzi Institute, we do with leaders. And I'd like to say about leadership is that there are people who follow leaders, but we're leaders at every level, even at the individual level, where we, we have agency and we're making choice for ourselves, And we may be the, the head of our block party or a PTA, but there's a, we running the family. So when I say leaders, I really mean everyone, is that um, uh, I'll give you an example. The fellow um, that was a outstanding computer scientist, he had a very small team. And because of his expertise, he went into a leadership position and he couldn't build trust with the other people on the team. Uh, he was very sincere about it. He had good intent about it, but what was absent, he didn't wasn't attending to his living presence in the way he did or didn't make eye contact, how he managed his mood, uh, places that he held himself back or the places that he blew up. He was pretty ignorant to those things because he had spent so much time, um, you know, really in the front part of the brain up in this brain here, not down here at the heart or at the belly. And so embodiment then is what are the skills needed then to be a leader in which you're able to manage mood, you make powerful declarations, you build trust with others, you have skillful communication. And we start to do practices to embody that. Thank you. And I love that you kind of brought up the declaration part of this work. Uh, one of the things that was really powerful for me in the training that I attended through the Strozzi Institute was, was the declaration, you know, what I am a commitment to. And it's something that I revisit often and utilize and practice. And so would you be willing to share a little bit about what that means and how it could be helpful for people? Yes. Um, you know, one of the really interests for me in working with people is that we, we, we begin to build, we begin to cultivate the self through working through the body. That means that there's a, the self and the body are intimately linked together. And we can cultivate the self by doing practices that come through, through the body for ourselves. And people became more self-aware. They became healthier, uh, 
emotionally and physically and spiritually. And what was missing for me was that inside of this, how can we make a commitment to contribute or engage with maybe some of the conundrums or conflicts we're feeling in the world? So to put it plainly, it wasn't at some point enough for me personally, enough wasn't enough for me in the work to go, wow, I got healthier. That's fantastic. Thumbs up. And from that sense of health, deep, deep health, physical health, emotional health, energetic health, spiritual health, what difference do I want to make in the world? Where do I want to contribute? And that's where the declaration comes in. And that declaration is a declaration is a speech act, which means that um, you're not just proclaiming something or announcing something. You're saying, I'm a commitment to this possible future. I'm a commitment to this possible future. So for example, as a speech act, we notice, we can say when the convener of two people getting married says, you are now married, that declaration, your world changes and your community changes. And then maybe 10 years later, when you're getting divorced and a judge says, you're divorced, he declares your divorce, your world changes again. So it's really looking at the, that speech act that is actually something embodied, which allows others to be able to um, uh, uh, connect to and draw from and form a mutuality with to producing a new, a new world. Thank you, because language is so powerful. It's energetic, there's an energy to it. And what I deeply appreciate as part of the kind of somatic centering exercise is that when we, which perhaps you might even be willing to guide us through in this conversation today, uh, that when I practice that, when I get really aligned, if you will, and then I focus my attention on that commitment, on that intention declaration, it feels like, you know, it's like being radiated out into the world. It is declared like that judge or the, you know, the fisher. It's, it's, it's declaring, you know, this is what I am committed to. And, and I do believe that that energetically does get radiated out of our heart when we are centered uh, in our height or with our depth and so on. And so one of the things that came up in the training as we were uh, being trained on resilience strategies is really kind of the difference between, you know, practicing resilience strategies and uh, kind of firing off some automatic strategies that we may have under pressure, some of which came from early childhood and so on. Would you be willing to kind of share with the audience what do we mean by that? I know you refer to that as conditioned tendency. What 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 is that, and why is it relevant again for people listening? Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Let me make a counter offer here, Varid. Let's let's um, take a moment here and do a centering practice, and then let's come back to um, the notion of once we get centered, what are the what is the history that begins to move that throws us off center. So let, let me invite everybody. You can do this practice sitting down. You could even do it lying down, uh, although we associate sleeping or napping with lying down. But basically, we want our spine straight. So if you're willing and if you're able, let's stand. That gives us a sense of being in our legs, too. And um, we're going to center in these dimensions we as all living things do this human body we have length we have width and then we have depth and then we have an organizing principle and we call that organizing principle purpose that we 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 can say oh i'm on this earth walk for this reason i'm here for this reason so when we're centered uh, everybody thinks that's a great idea. It's a good bumper sticker. It's a good magnet that you can put on the refrigerator. And um, what we're looking at is it becomes more than just a good idea. It becomes something that you are actually living in. And we're going to use those four dimensions. So what I'm going to ask you to do is bring your 
attention to the life of your body. What does that mean? Essentially, it means sensation. Can you feel temperature? Can you feel shape? For example, the shape your foot makes on the floor or the rug. Can you feel movement? Is there a sense of a, a quivering or a tremor or a streaming or even the movement of your belly or chest when you breathe? So we'll start just simply without changing anything and without prejudice, just bring our attention to our body and open up this possibility of feeling. For example, I feel the coolness in the room. I can feel my feet and there's kind of a urge for my toes to spread. I let my knees soften. I can feel the muscles around my pelvis, my buttocks start to relax. I didn't even know I was gripping there. And then in our length, we are aligning our head, our shoulders, our hips, our knees, and our feet. Now, you might ask, like, well, that's how it is. Head, shoulders, it goes down like this. But if you look, I'll turn a profile here. You'll see this. There's a head going forward. There's maybe pelvis going back. Maybe there's shoulders or behind the uh, uh, hips. So we're just, by coming into our length, essentially we're, we're building a much deeper intimate relationship with gravity. And gravity is 24 seven. And gravity's winning. If you don't think it's winning, look at a picture of yourself 10 years ago. <laughs> so this powerful force, this powerful force of gravity keeps us here and also allows us to spring off from here. So I'm aligning myself just as I spoke, it means that I'm straightening and I'm also relaxing down. And this is where you wanna look into relaxing. Let your eyes relax. Maybe you haven't ever heard anybody say that before. But if our eyes are tense, that gets transferred to the optic nerve. The optic nerve goes back to the brain. That will very subtly precipitate through our central nervous system. When my eyes are relaxed, my peripheral vision opens, come behind your eyes. The system's designed, the teeth never have to touch. So you're relaxing at the jaw, the hinge, and at the chin. Relaxing your tongue. Let your shoulders relax as if on a coat hanger. The system is designed so the mass of the body rests on the skeleton. That's distinct from the mass is holding the mass up. Let's do that for a minute. Lift your shoulders about an inch. That's mass holding mass up. At the end of the day, when you've done no physical labor or anything and your shoulders are sore, it's because you're fighting gravity. Let your shoulders down. Eyes relaxed, jaw relaxed, shoulders resting on the skeleton. Your breath is at the abdomen. It's low in the body and it's rhythmic. If it's hard to move into any of these places, just be really gentle and kind for yourself. If you're not accustomed to really checking into the body, other than sports or dieting or all those other things we see on magazine covers, uh, it may be a little bit like, oh, I, may, I can't feel my hips here. That's fine, just take a moment. Be receptive to we're in our hips. Those big strong muscles in the thigh can use 
feel, sense, or imagine that they're resting on the skeleton. The knees are soft. They're not necessarily bent. They're just soft. But everybody do this for a minute. Press your knees back. You feel what happens to your low back. Now we soften the knees. So that's length. And we say this is the human line of dignity. I'm not trying to overreach. I'm not trying to shrink myself. I'm in my dignity in the size and shape and social location for right now. Then there's width. Let's stay down at our feet. Feel balanced on your feet. At your knees. Your hips. Any place you can't feel in there, if you need to wiggle in, shift, you just feel free to do that. And with, I start to notice it in my breath, my rib cage actually goes out a little bit. Has My rib cage has width too. Balanced in the shoulders. And the tissues that hold this body actually radiate out from here. So can you feel your clothes next to your body, that width, front, the back, sides? If you have a, a, a four-legged friend, a cat or a dog, or any kind of, a, maybe a bird, some of you like reptiles, can you feel that living form in your width? I have a plant just to my left here, old friend. I have a number of plants in this room. Can I feel their livingness? I'm not trying hard to do that. I'm opening up to this possibility of my life to feel other life. When we're, when we're in our width, we're connecting to life. We go into a relationship space. From our dignity, we connect into others, the plants, the grasses, the waters. Now we come to depth. And because we have so many senses in front of us, and we have all these machines, handheld machines that we use in front of us, we have a sense of being forward. Back. Let's just do that for a minute. Kind of come on your balls of your feet. Like I'm in a hurry. I'm getting ahead. I need to make something happen. And then settle back. Feel, sense, or imagine those long muscles next to your spine. The backs of your legs. back of your neck. And it's really a feeling that you can settle back and into yourself. Like one of those dinosaurs that have those large tails, you can rest back onto that tail. And here, this is where our ancestors reside, our loved ones. Our, our teachers, our mentors, our guides. Places where we're competent at things. And staying settled back into yourself, bring your attention through the front of your body to out to the front. Put your left thumb on your belly button, let your palm rest. Right in the middle of your palm is your center of gravity. Many words about from that from many different cultures. This is where we find balance. This is also the place of intuition. 
where energy gets distributed for conscience coming up to the heart center, left hand up to your heart. And just take a moment and feel your hand there and let your chest feel your hand. And feel, sense, or imagine that you can give thanks to your heart. Doing that work even when we're sleeping, we never have to think about it. Compassion, love, warmth, care. Now let's touch just between the eyebrows, the eye center. This isn't about thinking, but this center here is the center of long horizons of time. Go ahead and let your hand come down. Maybe that horizon of time is even eternity. The mystery. Possibilities that we don't yet see or futures we don't yet see, but we can open up to. Now let's do this. I want you to extend your fingers. See, I'm extending my fingers. Extend your fingers and extend them down, straight down. And think that you're in the centered position. Centered is being present, being open and being connected. Present to others, present to the world, open to possibilities. And I'm connected to my purpose. And in this, this is a prayer of thankfulness to the earth. Whatever you ever eaten or drank has come from this earth, the beauty of it. Extending up to the heavens. So I'm looking up, my fingers are extended, giving thanks to the waters, the warmth, the light, that vast neighborhood of ours. Now let's extend out, palms are out. And let's give thanks to people, everybody, your your worst friend, your best enemy. We can give healing, positive energy out to the people of Ukraine and also to the Russian soldiers because they're oppressed they're suffering too. Left hand at your heart center, right hand at your belly. Now make your declaration, like what is your purpose for being on this earth walk? And we like to say it by saying, I am a commitment, not I'm committed to something out here. I'm embodying that commitment. You can say that to yourself. You can say it out loud and you're feeling yourself as you say that. Hands come down. Maybe when I said, what is your purpose? A lot of things run, came up, that's wonderful. Maybe nothing got settled, that's fine. We're just all on this inquiry together. So go ahead and take a seat. You wish. So that would be a great thing. I think I do it, and it's a great thing for me to do that every day. Get present, get open, get connected, remind ourselves why we're here, and giving giving thanks. That's what we call being centered. Thank you, Richard. I give thanks to you on behalf of all of us. Mm. I'm receiving that. Thank you, Erin. To the honor of all. <laughs> so, um, uh, Verd invited me to talk about <clears throat> what we call at Strozzi Institute our conditioned tendencies. And these are these 
ways of behaving, their shapes of being, their reactions that have allowed us to live in safety, belonging, and dignity. In other words, we've learned them a long time ago. And um, what they've done is that they've allowed us to come to this moment right here. And what they are is that when we have a, a perceived threat or a real threat, something of large scale or even small scale, you know, like, oh, I'm late, I'm gonna be late, I better hurry up. And all of a sudden we're not in center, but we're being pushed by this kind of reactive force we call our conditioned tendency. And, um, you know, Western psychology and Western philosophy have spoken a long time about this notion that we are historical beings and that histor history moves through us. Like I said, through this condition tendency. And as it moves through us, um, it may, uh, we may find out that what, what, what it took care of before no longer takes care of that. So we're not really in choice, we're just reacting. Now, what I, in, in, in my growth, in my studies, what I began to see is that psychology would take people to a threshold, but not through that threshold. There was insight, there was awareness, there was seen possibility of new ways of being. Maybe even I could even put my foot in that water or do something. And that's all good. But what was missing was then from with that level of awareness and centeredness, then how do we take new actions? How do we actually become different actors in the world, have new behaviors? And knowing about it, knowing about those triggers wasn't enough. And so what somatics does is that it opens this um, perspective that that can be felt in our body. Our conditions get felt in our body. What do I mean by that? We get triggered, our shoulders will go up. Why is that? Because, um, well, I'll give you a great example. Um, friend of mine, his studies were, were done. What, what makes people, how do you know people are telling the truth? Uh, why, are they, why are they credible? And so he um, uh, would take a picture on his doing his PhD of somebody who was afraid to the highlands of New Guinea and said, what, what, what are they feeling? And they go, oh, that person's afraid. And you go down to the streets of Paris and stop people and say, what emotion is that? And they'd say, that's afraid. It was kind of like Darwin. It's a universal sense. So if I, my shoulders go up, I'm trying to protect my juggler mane. Yeah, or I'll hold my breath, or I'll clamp down on my jaw, or I'll go to fight, or I'll retrieve, or I might disassociate. And we can know those things, but when we feel them in our body, we know that I'm not present. I'm being gripped by something that is historical and really not relevant to the present moment. Um, well, here's, here's a personal piece about this. I grew up in um, like projects, Navy projects. I moved around a lot. So there was always a, with other, the other males and young males, there was always a posturing like, where am I on the, on the totem pole here? Or where, where am I on the, the, the uh, food chain? And so I would get in scraps. I would get in fights. And that's why, that's why ultimately my mother put me in martial arts because Somebody told her I would, I would quit fighting, which I did. <laughs> but years later, I would walk in to some place with my partner, like a bar or restaurant, and immediately I would go, where are the exits? Who might be a problem here? And she would usually elbow me and say, just stop that. <laughs> now, I hadn't been in a fight for decades and decades and decades or even big arguments. But that, that automatically came forward. And she knew me enough to go, oh, I, 
I can feel you doing that. I can feel it in your body. So with that help, that feedback and me seeing it allowed me to become more present in the moment. So that's why we, we, it's so important that we, we notice what those condition tendencies are and what, what happens to us when we do that. For example, I'm going to ask you to do this. Everybody free your hands. So I'm just holding my hands free or to the sides like this. Now bring them together. And do it again. Open your hands. Now bring them together. So easy, so easy. And it's easy because that's what we've been doing our whole life. Now open your hands. And what I want you to do is there was ways that your, figure, your fingers configured, put them together, but in a different way. So when I, my right index finger was on top, now I'm doing it this way. And what I notice is right here, there's this little awkward moment. How does that work? That's the place in which our history comes forward. And when we change it, it's, it could be a feeling of awkwardness, not knowing, uncertainty, or actually having more boundaries. In order to have this new skill where I can change, takes practices. We just don't go, oh, I know I do that. Now I'll do something different. It doesn't work that way. It, we, we, we become no, new, new people. We can take new actions. We don't get caught in not always inside of this historical past by taking on new practices and neuroscience and the technology of neuroscience now proves that, that we change by taking, building new circuits through our brain and, and um, grounding ourselves in them. It's not rocket science. <laughs> This is so helpful because I think that this is really the essence of resilience is to be able to notice what those condition tendencies are. And when they are no longer serving us, like in, in the example that you shared, yes, you're not that little kid anymore. You don't need to behave in that old way. It's not serving you. Maybe it's even, you know, creating distress in the body, I imagine, which might not allow you to think as clearly in that moment without even being conscious of it. So in order to be more resilient, more adaptable, we've got to notice what's happening in the body. Perhaps like the situation that you mentioned, ask people around us to help us notice what is going on in our body. And then to, uh, you know, gain an understanding like, hmm, why am I doing that now, right? Like, why am I leaning forward? Why am I leaning back? Why am I holding my breath, right? To just be curious about that because I imagine that there's information there. And when we can get really curious about that rather than immediately kind of break that and go back to, you know, how we're supposed to be, but just kind of sit with that a little bit. I think, I think that there's great uh, wisdom in, in what our body is trying to tell us. And I agree with you that that's the moment where we can uh, appreciate our body and the way that it has served us and protected us for as long as it has. But also that's the moment of choice, right? Do I want to choose and do a centering exercise at this point to get my body back into a state of alignment and coherence so that I can choose a different path, take a different you know, decision or behavior at that moment. Yeah, and, and one of the wonderful things about it is that um, it's non-equipment intensive. <laughs> you can do it any, any place at any time. You know, you can do it. You can do it in a cornfield. You can do it at a bus stop. You can do it on in, in your chair. So the moment where you go, oh, my shoulders are rising. I'm heating up or I'm trying to disappear, going, oh, this, this is trying to take care of something and inform me, but is it really relevant to who I am at this age? Uh, the other thing I'd like to add here, Vera, uh, from what you said was that there's also a value when you're in a position with another, it could be your partner, it could be people that you lead, it could be your child or grandchild, 
is that you're able to then build an observer and you're going, oh, they're triggered now or their conditioned tendency is running through them. And the first thing that you can do is center yourself. So instead of reacting to their reaction, get yourself present because you know that their best self is not coming through in the moment. Just like when we're triggered, our best self is not online at that point. So it really is a valuable thing in being able to say and going, oh, they're triggered. And not that I have to think that I'm judging them for it, but it's part of the human condition. I have it. They have it. I can have compassion for it. And then um, uh, just get present with that and get curious how that is for them. Oh, and I think that's so beautiful. And that is what effective, you know, coherent communication is all about because our energies and entangled, if you will. Yes, my energy impacts yours and yours impact mine, impacts mine. And so when we can get grounded in our own alignment, centering, if you will, into our own soma and uh, notice what's happening with us and, and then, of course, get present, uh, then, as you said, we, we have a chance of really being curious because we're not in our own protective mechanism. Yes, we can really allow our unconscious mind to notice what is going on with the other uh, and have compassion and understanding for the other. And so I believe that the wonderful tools and practices that you share with our world, and many of them are available online and through your courses, uh, allow people to do that. I think a lot of the leaders that I work with, they get the concept, as you said earlier, consciously of being present or being uh, congruent or aligned but they just don't know how to do it or they feel they don't have time to do it. And as you said, this is not requiring any equipment. It really doesn't require much time either. It's a practice like anything else. We require repetition, but it is relatively simple to do and, and can absolutely transform how we show up in our own body, how we uh, show up with others, what energy we project. I know the courses are very much that you train about inspiring trust with others genuine trust and compassion and and ultimately you know being able to create what we wish to create in the world you know that commitment that we are and so i am so deeply grateful uh, richard for uh, what you have given to us today for what you share with our world um, you know it's just amazing how you know you had this experience as a kiddo growing up and all of these different situations that you were in which then led to your martial arts training which then you know allowed you to blend that with the interest in kind of the the psychology and other things that you'd learned to create this beautiful modality that allows all of us as you said we're all leaders of some type to be able to lead our own system our own body uh, with grace and dignity and also to be present with others um, I think that is the, the path of the future. And I thank you for that. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. And how can people learn more about you, your various institutes and trainings, um, and, and have more of this practice in their life? Well, um, I would suggest that um, first go to the uh, website of stroziinstitute.com. You know, Strozzi is S-T-R-O-Z-Z-I, like pizza, two Z's, strozziinstitute.com. And you can see our wide menu of um, courses that we do. We have a somatic coaching track. We have personal transformation track. We work with organizations and we um, uh, work with um, also individuals, individuals at all levels of, of um leadership yeah so so check out there i um you know as vera did mention before next month i have my ninth book coming out i kind of feel like i can call myself a writer now <laughs> i've always written things down but um so this is the ninth book it's called embodying the mystery and it has nothing to do with distilling anything into a lesson or any steps to anything but mostly i wrote about the, the fundamental experiences that have shaped me 
and the fundamental teachers that I've had and the practices that I was engaged in. And not necessarily like I'm saying these are the ones to do, but just to arouse basically our curiosity about this wonderful journey we have being in a, a human life and the great potential of it. Oh, thank you, Richard. I'm excited to read that. And, and that's why we start this podcast typically with that question. You know, how did you get to do what you do? I think it is so inspiring for people to listen to you and understand that, you know, or at least be curious that their path, um, you know, wherever they are on that path is guiding them towards something that is uh, highest and best for them, even if it might not feel that way in that moment. Um, that there is uh, something that we can trust. And, and sometimes hearing other people's stories uh, can give us permission to just be curious about our own path. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. What we say at Cro Strozzi Institute is take it easy, but take it. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. It's good to be on the, your podcast with you, Mary.